Now, whoever said making changes in life was easy, well, they probably never made a lot of changes in their life. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And welcome to the Monday edition of Truth to Ponder. And I'm your host, Bob Bierman. So glad that you're you're with us here as we begin another week. And you believe that we are now halfway through the month of May. And it won't be long before we're halfway through this year of 2022. Now, I, I opened the program today with this question about going through change. And for those that are regular listeners to the program, you know that my wife and I are currently in Virginia looking at making some major changes in in our life. Uh, we, we both have been through lives of our own. And, and now it's come that time for us to find our place, our time, while still doing the work that the Lord has given us to yet get done. And this looking at housing possibilities, trying to sell a place, all this, man, it takes its toll. I can remember when I was a lot younger, and maybe some of you can identify with this. When I was in my 20s, and even into my 30s, moving was frequent because of the kind of work that I did. I was a radio broadcaster, and and during the years of being an announcer, well, you, you change radio stations frequently. You went from a small station to a bigger station to even a bigger and bigger station and paycheck. It, it's the way it's the way the business has generally been. If you're able to find a way to afford to stay in a small town, yeah, some people do. But I understood even back in the 1970s that this industry that I was in would be going through some kind of change in time. And life got more stable when I got off being a radio announcer and spent more time in engineering. In a few years' time, I ended up working at a very stable place, Toccoa Falls College, and building their radio ministry. And then I entered the ministry as well. Radio always has been my primary income or subsidized my ministry work. And in some ways, it still does today. Not like it did in the past. This program doesn't subsidize our income. Uh, This is just something that the Lord has laid on my heart to do uh, as a service because I just feel that there's a lot of news out there we need to be talking about. And I've got some stories in front of me today. But I just want to give you kind of an update on what we're finding in this part of Southwest Virginia. And there are several regions we have looked at. There may be a couple more to look at soon. We'll head back to Georgia shortly, sometime probably this week, maybe the weekend. I don't know. A lot of it just depends. A lot of it just depends on on, on how we sit down and try to write out on a piece of paper the things that we need to have versus the things we'd like to have. Uh, sure, I need a I need a place in a home that is quiet that I can record. Uh, where we're at right now, I have a place I can kind of do that, but I have to share the room. and And when I'm working, everybody else has got to leave, and it is it's not conducive really for the kind of setup you need to do a radio program. But those are minor things that can be worked out. What other kind of ministry work does God have for me besides this radio program? I really believe that part of what I need to be doing going forward is helping equip people for the world in which we are about to be living within. I mean, the world as we know it, the world as we knew it, it's never really going to come back. I don't care what any politician is telling you that we can get back to pre-pandemic times. Well, honestly, even pre-pandemic times were not all that great either, if you really want to think about it. But but wait, but Bob, uh, Trump was in office here in the United States. Yeah, he was. He was. And he was an interrupter to the globalist. But that's all anybody will ever be is an interrupter. One of the things that 
is hard sometimes even for me to fully comprehend and accept. This world, this world has a date with destiny. It's got a date with destiny. And God knows when that date is. I look in just my lifetime, the things that have occurred, the things that were hard to believe happened. Now, granted, I was in elementary school when the Supreme Court decision came to so-called forbid prayer in public schools. Now, it really didn't impact me directly. I, I kind of knew about it, but I didn't because I went to a parochial Christian school. So we were still allowed to pray. In what I would call my bubble world in a town called Hicksville, New York in Long Island, it was a bubble world. We were the kids of the 50s and early 60s. And we were living the suburban dream with most of our parents having served in the Second World War in some fashion or another. Maybe some of the younger ones served, you know, possibly possibly in Korea. Increasingly, people were moving out of New York City, you know, Queens and Brooklyn, and heading into Nassau County, Long Island. And as more people came into the more western part of Nassau County, closer to the city, the property value started to rise dramatically, like it does in many places. And all of a sudden, a lot of industries started really kicking off and opening up in the 50s and 60s, really ramped up in what is called Middle Island. It's really not the middle of Long Island. It's kind of a third of the way out. And you had companies like Grumman and all of these support industries to what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex. Raytheon, I'm trying to think of names of just dozens upon dozens of companies and test corporations were opening up shop on Long Island. And so there were a lot of plentiful, good-paying jobs around Hicksville, Plainview, Westbury, and, and that immediate region. Neighborhoods were being built. Schools were being built. Parochial schools were being built. And it was a good time to be a kid. We didn't have a high crime rate. People knew who their neighbors were on the same street and even behind you. Parents knew the other parents on the street. The time for us to come in for dinner was pretty much when the street lights came on, no matter what time of the year that it was. And sometimes in the dead of winter, you know, even later than that. We never thought much about crime. We never really worried about locking our doors. And we rode our school buses. We did all the things we were supposed to do. And we had a significant group of friends. This was the, this was the Long Island. This is the outside of New York City I knew. We knew that when you got into maybe Brooklyn or Queens, well, the crime rate went up and you're, you're living in more crowded conditions. By 1968, my dad decided even Long Island was getting too busy for his liking. And the opportunity came for us to move to a small town in upstate New York where I went to high school. I was just finishing the eighth grade when we moved, and I went through my senior year, of my, my, my four years of senior high school in a little town not far from Lake Ontario. Once again, you know, you never worried about locking your doors. You could go to the grocery store and people were not using bitter, foul, and obscene language loudly people would hold doors open they were polite they didn't cut you off in traffic but over the years things have changed and i and i look at the life that that god has allowed me to live when i left that small town in upstate new york i ended up in akron ohio for a while working in canton ohio and and going to school in cuyahoga falls Ended up in the metropolitan New York City area for more college. 
even thought maybe I'd like to work in New York City in radio. You know, the number one market, why not? But, you know, it was never meant to be. Came close one time, but never was meant to be. And I can remember deciding, I can remember somebody when I was in college was talking about the place to go, you know, the real place to to live and grow in 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 a growing community is going to be near Atlanta, Georgia. And I'd only been to Atlanta one time briefly in 1966. That's a long time ago. I guess I was 12 years of age. And I really don't remember it that well. There were really no skyscrapers yet in Atlanta. And hard to believe that it was about maybe mm, 13, 14 years later, I'd be living around Atlanta, working. And it was a very rapidly growing city. But over time, I've learned to really appreciate the smaller town communities. They're getting harder to find. And even when you find some small town communities, the crime rates are higher than they were, you know, 50 years ago, substantially higher. In many parts of what I call small town America, the knowing of your neighbors is not like it used to be. It just isn't. And that's sad. There's a lot of small town America that is that's losing its character because people are trying to escape the city and they bring all of their fears and phobias with them when they come to the country. So what's become really hard for my wife and I in this process, we want to be near family, obviously. But how close? You know, five minutes away, 10 minutes away, 45 minutes away, maybe an hour away. And, and we're, seeing, we're seeing places that we can afford. They're a bit off the beaten path. Um, thankfully, I'm not looking to get a job because I'm retired. I mean, my wife and I, we live essentially on a fixed income. I mean, we have our, our retirement income. That's it. We're not working anymore. Oh, I've been known to do an occasional engineering job for somebody, but that's over a period of, of a few days. Not It's not a, a long-term obligation. I came out of retirement two years ago uh, to help for three months in emergency management. But I don't, generally speaking, have a job anymore. I'm, I'll be 68 this year. And it just felt the right thing to do a few years back to retire. And give me the time that I would need to do things that God would have me to do. And God has been just wonderful to provide the opportunities for me to do the things that I do today. But I'm also fully recognizing something. And this is what I want to be, want you to really understand. At this age, I'm not making plans for the next 25 or 30 years of my life. I don't think I'll be doing this radio program when I'm 97. I really don't. I'd be surprised if I was. I'd be surprised if the world was still here at that point, the way things are going. But I recognize with the time, while we have time, let us do good unto the household of faith. As it comes from Scripture. While we have time, there is important news to share. While we have time, I need to use some of that time to to train and equip young pastors and leaders in dealing with the the church of, under persecution. Now, I've made this statement dozens upon dozens of times, and I, I don't want to sound like a broken record. But what I've seen in my lifetime, what I've seen in my lifetime is that, generally speaking, the enemy of our soul, the demonic realm, the reprobate mind, call it whatever you want, they've been getting like one, one and a half steps forward, and and we've ended up getting at least one of those steps back. And, and so the there was a book out years ago by... Uh, 
by Judge Bork, you know, slouching toward Gomorrah. And that's what the United States has been doing in, in my lifetime, probably started before that, but it was never on the surface. It was always behind closed doors. But by the 1960s, it began to peer its head and make itself visible. And we've been having this slouching toward immorality, uh, self-centeredness, just vileness ever since. And for the longest time, you know, there was like the evil took a step forward, then maybe another step, and then we got a step back. And, and the process, the undoing process of education, the undoing process of spirituality, the undoing process of being decent and moral and caring has systematically, about every decade, has been cut significantly. And it keeps getting cut more and more and more. 1965, I guess I was, you know, a young kid still in uh, getting ready, probably you know, still in elementary school, not quite at junior high, middle school level yet. When Lyndon Johnson proposed the idea of the Great Society. And, and the Great Society, while it sounded good to many what I call classic liberals of the day, you know, to make uh, life easier and better for all, to be more fair. It all sounded good on the surface. But it was the beginning of the decimation of the family, responsibility, and, and even moral fortitude and, and undergirding of our society began to erode rapidly as a result of free stuff. No responsibility. Couple that with the 1968 concept of it feels good, do it. And on and on we go. And then, you know, in the 1970s, the Roe versus Wade decision began to open the floodgate of abortion. And we can go on and on with these pivotal points in time. And how we get to a point that most Americans say we've gone too far and we try to pull back a little, but we're still too far away from where we need to be. In this past decade, in less than a decade, the speed in which we have moved as a nation, as a people, it's scary. Yet nobody wants to talk about it. But it's absolutely frightening to me, the things that happen. You know, you, you can't even go into a fast food place in many communities anymore with somebody not using four-letter words, you know, talking I mean, loudly to other people. They don't care anymore. It's not that they keep it in their own homes. It, it's just become, you know, that's what I do, and it, I don't care if you don't like it in public. That's what I do. And this is the world in which we are finding ourselves in today. The church... Christians have been pathetic over the past 25, 30 years. Just pathetic. Sorry, I'm just going to call it like I see it. I'm thinking of a couple of churches over the years that I've been involved with. I'm going to go back to one that I helped when I, when I, first, when I first moved south. I became a member of a small mission church in a town in northeast Georgia. And... It had high hopes, had a retired pastor that had come to live in that town to help guide the mission so we didn't have to worry about paying clergy. The denomination was relatively large, and they were able to seed some money into developing a church in this community. And it started to grow. That was pretty much 1975, 76. When my wife and I ended up coming back to that town in 1986, we came back to that town in 86 when I went to work for Tacoa Falls College. The church was still there, but it was now meeting in a small converted house near downtown with a handful of people about maybe 30-ish. Still a mission, still relying on 
retired clergy that didn't have to be paid to keep them going. But there were a few newer faces and even uh, some families. We're talking, this is 1986, so we're talking people now in, in their 30s and 40s, some that had some kids. And the decision was made to find property and build a church building. I mean, they had outgrown this, but it had taken them that long to get where they were. Once again, a part-time church with a part-time effort with no real vision and no real push, it, it, it just kind of goes slowly. But my, my wife and I had come back to that town. I became very active. I ended up on the building committee and a bunch of other things within that church and leadership. And within two years, we broke ground and built this beautiful building, had a sanctuary, office space, kitchen, uh, classroom space, fellowship hall, property. And from the map, when we purchased the property, it was going to be at a major intersection of the primary highway coming into town and where the bypass would be in future development for retail and other growth. Nice, visible piece of dirt. And we built the building. And during the time that I was there at that church until God opened up doors for different ministry in a different place and what have you, the church was growing at a, at a pretty steady, not rapid, but steady rate. And you would predict that with the young families that were showing interest in coming on board, that give that church another, you know, five or ten years, it's going to be it's going to be full and probably having to utilize more of that property that was purchased at the time for future development. Well, as I told you, my my life took a different turn uh, between radio and then ministry within a similar denomination for me and in, in terms of style. Ended up moving to Florida to be a pastor of a church down there. and my, my late wife and I moved in 1998 to Florida, and I have spent most of my time in Florida in one way or the other uh, from 1998 all the way up until, you know, recent, recent times. Uh, I've, I've not been a resident Except for a few years, when I left uh, when I left Florida to go to do some secular work in the early two thousands, I mean, I, I pretty well, you know, have, have been a Floridian. Well, about a year ago, actually, I take that back. Prior to the pandemic, two thousand nineteen, probably October around my birthday, as I remember, 2019. My wife and I, we have our our place up in the mountains in Georgia, and that's only about an hour, less than an hour away from Tacoa. And one Sunday, well, one weekend, I said, you know, we have this weekend off. Why don't, I'd love to go visit incognito, you know, my old church. And I'd kind of reached out to some people, you know, that were there to find out. And and, and we decided to, to go to that church on a Sunday morning in Georgia. And I went in there, the building that we had built, and not that many people. I recognized some of the faces, but they had aged substantially since the 1980s and early 90s. Here we are now, 20-some-odd years later, and those that were in their 40s are now in their 60s, and those that were in their 50s are in their 70s. Those that were in their 50s or seven or 60s are now in their 80s or 90s. And the church has really not grown. There are a couple of new families that moved into the area. Their impact in the community is minimal. The pastor, well-paid, has a retired mentality. And they don't do much in the community. Their, their Facebook page, their website is thoroughly out of date. Nobody cares. And, and they just do all that they need to do uh, to, to keep the doors open. And they, they just say, they try to make excuses why they haven't grown, why they don't do this. Well, you know, the building is a little bit below grade, and that's why people don't want to cut. I've never heard such silliness in my life. 
Excuses, excuses, excuses. This is pre-pandemic. So if you have a church in pre-pandemic times with an elderly congregation that's not thoroughly being fed the word of God like they should be, the fear of a virus is going to take hold in that group. And I have to wonder how they keep the doors open in a church that I put so much of my heart and soul in 40, you know, 30 and 40 years ago. And it's sad, to say the least. The, the pre-pandemic church, the churches that were growing leaps and bounds and building all of these family life centers. You remember, that was the big thing. You had, you had a church building out there in the country. Saw this all across Georgia and the Carolinas and Alabama and Tennessee. You'd see uh, like a Baptist church, maybe maybe a, a, an assembly of God. It, it doesn't matter. And I'm, I'm just saying this was the world. And everybody had to get one of those big family life center things going, the big metal buildings with a gymnasium. And, the, and we're going to just, this, this is going to be the solution for the church. And, and now those same churches that had all of this stuff going for them in the 80s, 90s, and early even 2000s. So many of them are struggling to keep their doors open today. And you go to some of the bigger cities. It doesn't even matter, even in the South, you know, so-called Bible Belt. How are churches doing today compared to 30 years ago? Not well. I, I, I drive this statistic home every chance that I get as we do this radio program to be reminded that literally 53% of the United States population today is totally unaffiliated with anything that even resembles a religion, let alone being Christian or a faithful believer. In other words, 53% of Americans are not churchgoers. They're not synagogue goers. They're not, they don't even go to anything. They're not even part of a cult, let alone anything else. Of the 47% that do affiliate with a church, the majority of them, their attendance is rare or seldom. It's more like under, you know, 10 times a year, if that. So if you kind of follow, when you try to get down to those that really believe and are true believers, uh, that number is dwindling. And we are the salt and light, according to Scripture, in this world. And there's less salt and there's less light being shown around us today. There are pockets there are pockets that I'm, I'm feeling and seeing. You know, even in, in North Georgia, there, there's still, there's still a, a significant percentage of Christians, but they're moving because of their closeness to an Atlanta. They're moving every year. That percentage of believers is declining. And, and I, I mentioned to my wife the other day that I, I, it seems like this part of Virginia that we're in, in terms of the number of churches and people that go to a church or what have you, doesn't matter what denomination, it's more like Georgia and South Carolina was 25, 30 years ago. In that regard, certain pockets, not everywhere, not, not every community, where we're talking like from Bristol up to Roanoke off I-81, but there are pockets off Interstate 81 where the churches are still doing okay. They were deeply hurt during the pandemic, obviously, with Governor Northam, and many will never fully recover. And this is the area that we have family that we deeply care about. And so we are in this time of discernment of what God would have us to do. Now, I'm going to be running over here, and I don't want to do that. We have a break coming up in just a couple of minutes. 
And I plan to share a little bit more about this journey we're on on the other side of the break and then a few news stories. I didn't really mean to go in this direction. I, I, I almost feel like I need to apologize, you know, for talking about what we're facing. But there's a part of me that says some of you are facing the same things as we try to find sanctuary in this world. We've gone from the enemy of our soul taking one or two steps forward and we get one, sometimes both the steps back, to the enemy taking two, three, and four steps forward. We're lucky to get one or two of them back. And it's happening at such a rapid rapid pace, and that's what I'll be getting into on the other side of the break. Trying to outline how fast we have slouched toward being a Sodom and Gomorrah, to being a reprobate society run by reprobates heading for a day of destiny. We're right there. And and what do we do during this time? Some say, well, I'm not going to worry about it because, you know, we get, we get a get out of tribulation free pass when it gets bad. It's getting bad now. And I don't see anybody, you know, disappearing anytime soon. It's got really bad over the last 2,000 years, worse than we're seeing it today around the world. It hasn't come to an end yet. And the United States is not exempt from God's judgment and tribulation and persecution. Persecution of true believers is next in store right here in parts, not all, but in many areas of the United States. And I'm going to deal with that on the other side. Before this month runs out, we need to be able to raise the funds to take care of paying the radio airtime bill. I am not a paid employee of Truth to Ponder. As a matter of fact, there are no paid employees at Truth to Ponder. Uh, Truth to Ponder's assets consist of a little bit of equipment, and that's it. But if you can help us keep this on the air, And right now, I'm really wanting to see growth on our frequency that heads west, 9455 kilohertz. Beginning to hear from people now. And and I need to see if there are other air times available because shortwave is still important. Podcast is a wonderful thing to have, and I'm glad that we have the opportunity. I'm glad that so many listen. By the way, if you listen in some places as a podcast and you hear a commercial at the beginning before it starts, I don't get a penny out of that. That's what I have to give up to have things at iTunes and other places. It's just I get nothing out of it. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's Spotify or iHeartRadio. This, this podcast is still appearing there. Whatever commercial you hear, they, they are the 100% beneficiary. There are times I've wondered maybe I should open up 30 seconds or a minute in this program for organizations and products that I believe in uh, that you need to know about and whatever they would help uh, in, in covering the cost would help grow the program. But so far, I haven't felt led to do that yet. But, but for now, if you can help us stay on the air, and make a check payable to Ancient Word Radio. That's our parent ministry, Ancient Word Radio. Mailing address is Truth to Ponder, 5753 Highway 85 North. That's 5753 Highway 85 North, number 3248. That's number 3248. The city is Crestview. Crestview, Florida. Crestview, Florida. And the zip code is 32536. That zip code again is 32536. And we'll be right back. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. The Moon Pledge. Coming up. Shalom Alechem. This is the nice Jewish boy, Jonathan Kahn, your Jewish connection, bringing you the riches of your Jewish roots in Jesus. Now get your pen out as fast as you can so you don't miss out on receiving a special free gift that you're going to love and you're going to get in a moment. 
The full moon, real significant in the Bible. They marked key dates in the ancient calendar. It was considered the fullness of the month. In the middle of the month was the full moon. Now, interesting thing. In a Hebrew marriage, the groom would have to visit the house of the bride, and he, there he'd give a gift for her and pledge his love to her, and, and she would pledge herself to him. And they would share a cup of the covenant together, and they would pledge each other to each other the Kiddushin, it's called, the betrothal. And when would that happen? When would the Hebrew groom pledge his love and life to the bride? It was considered to do this the best time at the full moon. Under the full moon, the covenant was made. At the full moon, the groom pledged his life to the bride, and the bride received the pledge and gave her pledge to him. Under the full moon, they shared in the cup of the covenant. They pledged their life. Now, Messiah gave us a cup of the covenant, the last supper. He shared in his cup, his supper. And then he died. He gave his life on the cross. When? On Passover. When was that? It was the 14th and 15th of Nisan, which was the night of the full moon. When he died, there was a full moon. He was buried under a full moon. Why? Because he's the bridegroom. And the bridegroom pledges his life, gives the pledge. When the full moon comes, he gives his pledge. So he has given his pledge to you, a pledge even beyond marriage. How do you respond? You pledge yourself to him and your love and your all because the covenant is given and so it must be sealed under the full moon. And he has given his covenant and pledge to your life. You do the same to him. Want more? Ask for the gospel of the moons. Now, feeling like your walk with God could use a real spiritual boost? We got the answer. Free subscription to Sapphire's Warning Uses Directed can change your life for victory. And the incredible Mystery of the Temple Doors... You'll love it. It's all free. How do you get it free? Easy. Just remember Jesus' real Hebrew name, Yeshua, and you dial it. So just dial 1-800-YESHUA-1. You will be blessed, but call now. That's 1-800-YESHUA-1. And I invite you to minister with me in two of the most exciting ministries, to be in the word of life around the earth, to every tribe and tongue, and to Israel, the Jewish people who gave it to you. How? Just call 1-800-YESHUA-1. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A-1. Now, you can write direct. Just write to the nice Jewish boy. That's me at box 1111 Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644. It's the nice Jewish boy, box 1111 Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644. Until next time, this is Jonathan Kahn saying he pledged himself to you. You live a life of pledge to him. In Messiah, Hatan, the bridegroom of your life. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And welcome back to part two of Truth to Ponder for this Monday. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. We've been talking about a, a number of things in this first segment. I didn't really plan for it to go in the direction that it did. I really had some news stories that I wanted to share. But you want to know something? There'd be plenty of bad news out there all week. I don't have to always remind you of the bad news. I think a lot of you already know that we are living in a very peculiar and a kind of a perilous time. Perilous times always come. And, and I want to get this clear to my audience in the United States and in Canada in particular and, and other places where you have always thought that trials and tribulations were somewhere way down the road and we would never have to worry about it. Yet I see, I see all over the world Christians losing their life. I mean, I get, I get emails every day, and I have news stories that come across my, my desk every day about how in some places in the world, being a Christian can and will cost you either your job, your home, your family, or your life. And we don't we take that for granted in the United States and we we have this this incorrect idea that those things will never happen here. You know, I I can remember back in the nineteen eighties, nineties, even early two thousands, the the idea of a church having to worry about government interference was something that was not a big deal. Maybe in some cities zoning and there was always somebody out there to make a church's life miserable. I can remember reading, and I'm trying to remember where it was, somebody shared an article with me that goes back about maybe seven or eight years ago. And, and a person had written a letter to the editor of a local newspaper. 
And this person had lived in a large city. I don't, I can't remember which one. It doesn't make any difference. And, and decided he was going to move out to the suburban part of, of, of town, you know, or, 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 or the region. In other words, he was going to get out of the city and be able to live in a smaller town and, you know, be able to take, I think, a train or something to where he, where he worked in the city. And he's writing this letter to the editor, complaining about the new place in which he had now moved, out a little farther away from the big city, that he had found himself a, a condominium that had been recently built, but it was not that far away from a, a church building that had been there for, you know, decades, probably close to a hundred years at that point. And on Sunday mornings, when church services began, they would ring the bells. And this guy was looking for advice on how to, you know, petition the the city or the county, whoever was in charge, to make them stop. Because I moved out here to get away from the city, and I don't want to be bothered by your church bells that were here for a hundred years before I arrived. That's the kind of mentality that some people have today. They want to come to an area, but they want to bring their values and sometimes the things that ruined where they're living at to where they're coming to. That's going to be an issue for Florida, uh, where we still are, we're still residents, whether we remain permanent residents or just part-time or, or no time, I don't know. Everything with us is thoroughly up in the air. Totally up in the air. But we have people that decided that living under Governor Cuomo's New York or Murphy's New Jersey was not a good thing to do. Or in now you have Governor Hochul in New York. Hochul, they're, they're, they're leaving New York. They're selling out and they're moving to Florida. And I just hope that they don't bring some of the same voting habits and other things that was destroying New York and and ruin Florida. You know, Florida is going to get busier and busier in certain places, but still not near as busy and traffic congested as some of the places that these people are leaving. You know, I miss small town America. I miss knowing your neighbors. And maybe that's one of the reasons I like this part of the world. I keep talking about an area that has sanctuary. Am I, am I supposed to build it? Or is that just something I'm supposed to be a part of? At age 68, 67, going on 68, what part of this do I have in the grand scheme of things? I don't know. I really covet your prayers more now than I ever have since I began this radio program, you know, 20 some odd months ago. Because we're coming to a pivotal point in time. I started this program during the height of the pandemic in 2020, the height of the political season of 2020, the using of this pandemic to take control over people's lives, watching how certain places were treated differently than others. You know, churches were treated terribly compared to most other places outside of restaurants. How the virus seems to avoid large Walmarts and, and but never comes to other kind of stores or places. I mean, it, it just... Everything about what was done, I I think, was a trial run to see how far they can go. You can agree with that premise or not. But I really believe that Dr. Wong, who I'm going to get back on the program again soon, you know, he's looked over this and and he makes an interesting analogy. You know, we, we have these really awful, well, flu pandemics about once every 50 years or less. Massive, you know, we we hear about the Spanish flu of back in 1918 or that that thereabouts, 1968, 50 years later, we've got, you know, the Hong Kong flu that killed 
untold thousands. We may never know how many died in 1968 or 1969 because the media never dwelled on it. And life went on. But this go-round was different. And everything attached to it has had this very, very strange feel to it. You know, it, it, it got under my skin, and that's why I walked away from it. I mean, I went into helping in 2020 in the pandemic with an open mind and an open heart. But the more things that I saw, the more I realized there's something demonic about all of this. Demonic. The only word I can use, demonic. Seeing some of the silliness, seeing some of the draconian measures, seeing people, you know, locked in their homes. You can't go out to exercise. You can't go out to walk your dog. You can't do, especially in Canada. And now if you want to have your life back, you must be part of a a global experiment with a vaccine that they keep promoting. They keep pushing. Yet the numbers are undeniable. They don't work. They have potentially lethal side effects for many people. And the long-term effect on health is unknown. But the trending is not good. We now know that these vaccines provided a brief window of slightly enhanced immunity to be traded off for lower immunity. And so you've got these globalists like Bill Gates saying, you know, maybe everybody over 50 will need to have at least, you know, two jabs a year for the coronavirus. Well, if you're trying to kill off the baby boomers and half a Gen X, that's probably a good way to do it. I really believe there is something nefarious and satanic and demonic about all of it. And you have all these people afraid of their jobs, their careers. They don't want to ask questions, and they just try to go along to get along. And now we're looking at, here in the United States and pretty much globally, we've got reprobate. We got reprobates in charge. We've got demo- we have demon possessed people in charge of our government. I'm just going to say it. There, some of the stuff that happens in this country, the only explanation is they're demonically possessed, or they've cursed God so vehemently that, as Second Thessalonians states, they have been given over to delusion, unto damnation. And they believe the lie and reject any and all truth. I mean, we have these crises one after the other after the other. Infant formula shortage. How did that happen? Well, I'll give you the really quick explanation you probably haven't heard anywhere. Abbott Labs has the government contract for the approved baby formula for the WIC program, you know, the Women, Infant, and Children's program. Several months ago, there was an issue, allegedly, and I'm saying that allegedly traced to their manufacturing facility that makes all of this formula for all of these millions upon millions of infants and children. They said there was some kind of a outbreak of some kind of bacteria and that there had been two known two, two known cases, and maybe some people that were sick. Now, you'd think after over three months, this place that had never had these issues before, that whatever the issue was could be resolved. But that plant is still shut down. That plant is still shut down. And so we have a immediate shortage because of the significant number of people that are dependent upon the WIC program. And other companies, you know, are, are, are trying to figure how to gear up to make to take up some of the slack. It doesn't happen that easy and that fast. There, there are supply chain issues to make that happen. And then we have, of course, a percentage of, 
of those formulas going to to the border, to those that are crossing the border illegally. Now, somebody tried to give the argument to me, oh, so those kids are supposed to starve. And I'm, I'm going, that's not even a fair comparison. That's a reprobate-minded comparison. You're trying to make an equivalency that I must hate those people and only like these people. That's not true. The truth is, if that plant, the Abbott Labs plant, was functioning there'd be plenty to go around for everybody, even those that are crashing the border. It wouldn't be an issue. But we have all these problems in our supply chain that just don't seem to want to go away. And it seems like the federal government fans the flame of the fire to make anything worse. You know, when you start losing suburban women... And when I'm saying the suburbs, I'm talking about, you know, soccer mom suburb territory, you know, little McMansions and minivans back in the day. Now they're, you know, SUVs to haul your kids to soccer or whatever else they're doing. I mean, that that's, you know, that's suburbia. That's, you know, the the where the the big money houses are. And the big stores and, and the trendy restaurants and all that go with it. They're the ones that wanted to get out of the city, and they're just a handful of miles away. It's like if you're in the Atlanta area, this would be like Roswell on the north side of town. Uh, maybe as far south or you know, far to the northwest as maybe Marietta or uh, you know, some of those areas, maybe even Gainesville. Those are becoming the new suburban lands. And then if you're up in South Carolina near Greenville or Columbia or Charlotte, you know, you know, you have Tiga K and those kind of communities. That's suburbia, you know, the wealthy suburban lands, even the liberal leaning housewives. Well, I wouldn't even call them that just the women because they they have careers for the most part, too. Even they're beginning to doubt their Democrat leaders. Have you thought Democrats were in trouble But they don't care because I think they have a plan to try to steal the election anyway in 2022. They're going to try to minimize this. I think I think the Republicans are committing political suicide with some of the candidates, rhinos that are out there that I don't trust. You know, these women that are now beginning to doubt Biden's ability, they're the ones that by a margin of 57 percent to 42 percent favored Biden. Well, they still kind of favor Democrats because they they don't like being held accountable morally on the issue of abortion and on anything that's a moral issue. But the Democrats are in trouble and don't think they don't know it. They're not stupid. They're not stupid. They're planning. They're planning. All these things that come out, whether I don't care if it's Ukraine or anything else, they're all designed to keep your mind at bay, to look over here and not over there. Don't see this, but see that. See, when you're focused on on the economy, and right now, when you're retired like my wife and I are, and you have a fixed income that's not, I'm not expecting any kind of raises I I expect for the remainder of my life to see what buying power we have consistently erode. Just consistently erode. Any little amounts we would have on our savings account are just eroding because inflation is always going to outpace the interest you're going to get from the banks. Why? Because the government keeps printing money through the Fed, making the value of the money that's remaining worth less. And event and eventually thoroughly worthless. The day's going to come. So that's why one of the reasons that I feel that I need to get away from from where you know from taking housing away from people that need housing because that's where the jobs are. I don't need the job anymore. People would say, "Well, why would you want to live in certain small towns that we're looking at?" I mean, there's the economy's not that great. Well, you're right. 
some of the things that used to drive their economies and certain manufacturing plants are in China now. And so the job prospects are not great, but it may be a great place for people that are self-sufficient to gather and live. Some of those communities. There's a lot of praying that my wife and I've got to do. Just pray that the place that we have in Georgia can be sold in a reasonable amount of time at a fair and honest price. That's all I'm asking for. I'm not asking to come out with some super windfall. Just what is it really worth in today's money? And then take that and decide where God is going to have us go. There's so many things that are happening in the background. And, and, you know, I, I feel I'm just going to come out and say it. I need to do more with this radio program than I'm doing. There was a time that I could. There was a time, you know, a year ago when I could spend the time, print everything else that I needed, and I wasn't being divided in five directions. I need to get that life back, that kind of a, a, an office setting back. I need to do more in ministry, in training, you know, the future pastors that we may have in these small, literally in some places, tiny churches. Because in the big cities, the big churches are going to be always a target. There'll always be some pandemic. I mean, how many of you believe that we'd be still talking the coronavirus, you know, going into year number three? We started in 2020, then 2021. Then here we are going into our third year, entering our third year of all Rona all the time. When does it come to an end? Whenever the powers that be decide to give you a little bit of respite and they steal your freedoms with those, you know, four steps forward and give you two or three back, but you've lost freedoms that you'll never see again. We have declined morally in ways we'll never recover again. We've, you know, we're trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube. It doesn't work. That's the world in which we live today. And it's going to spin out of control. And we're going to keep watching this moral fabric disintegrate and eventually burn off. How bad will it get? Who knows? If I had been doing this radio program, let's say in October of 2019, or let's just say three years ago. Let's say it was, you know, the 16th of May, 2019. And I'm talking about helping to grow and develop churches. I knew that that the climate was not as easy to develop and grow a church because, as the Bible says, the great falling away had already, you know, been a part of of, of the package. And so people are not as church minded. We've lost a whole generation. Throw in the pandemic, throw in the government control, throw in the fear, throw in, you know, even people that don't want to go to church because they're afraid the road is going to kill them. You know, we we have an uphill battle. But just because it's uphill doesn't mean we give up the fight. I'll pick up on this tomorrow. If you believe in this ministry, would you consider supporting us financially to pay for the radio airtime bill? Make a check payable to Ancient Word Radio, Ancient Word Radio. And the address is 5753 Highway 85 North. That's 5753 Highway 85 North. Secure box number 3248. That's number 3248. And we are in Crestview. Crestview, Florida. That's one word, Crestview, Florida. And the zip code is 32536. That zip code again is 32536. We're going to pick up on this topic of, you know, getting ready for the days that are coming. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. To find out more, visit our website, truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth to Ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.